Patrick, in really wanting to understand free will, it used to be we only could consult philosophers. Now, brain scientists, neurophysiology, my old field, is making its play to become a real power in understanding free will. It started with the famous experiment with Benjamin Libet. I want you to explain it to me. I think I understand it, but I may need some help. Particularly the readiness potential, which there's a lot of controversy about. Of course. So let's just revisit the Libet experiment. So the Libet experiment, which has dominated the field of scientific studies of free will in the last uh, few decades, is actually quite simple. So there are a couple of parts to it. The first part is that the participant in the Libet experiment is watching a clock, and it's an unusual clock because it's only got one hand. Mm. And the hand of the clock goes round and round every 2,560 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And that clock is just there so that the participant in the experiment can report when they feel what Libet called the urge to move. Mm. So we can think about that as being the experience of conscious will. So I might feel I really want to press a button or lift my finger or lift my arm. And that feeling can be timed using this rotating clock. So the instruction to the participant is to simply, at whatever time they feel like it, not when the clock is at 60 or 30 or 45 or 15, but whenever you feel like it, just make a movement. In Libet's original experiment, it was a, a wrist movement, but nowadays people tend to just ask the participant to press a button. So the participant is going to um, make this action. The clock continues to rotate. It stops at a random location. And then the question to the participant is, where was the clock hand when you first felt the will to move? Mm. And it turns out that people report feeling a, an urge, as Libet put it, or a, an experience of conscious intention, as I would call it, somewhere 200, 300 milliseconds or so before they press the button. Mm. So there's a feeling which people are able to report. It's a conscious experience which precedes the moment of action by a few hundred milliseconds. I think about it as being the experience of, I am about to press the button. Mm -hmm. The interesting neuroscientific part of the Libet experiment is while all this was going on, he was recording brain activity. So we know that the brain functions because the billions of neurons or nerve cells in the brain have electrical activity. They fire little electrical impulses. And we can record that electrical activity using small electrodes placed on the scalp, non-invasively, it doesn't hurt. Um, and we can measure tiny, tiny voltages on the surface of the head, which correspond to the electrical discharges of the neurons in the brain. Now, these voltages are minute. They're of the order of millionths of a volt. But we can amplify them up, and we can record them. And we can look at the electrical activity that precedes the person's action. And that's really all that the readiness potential is. So the readiness potential is the name that was given back in the 1960s by the uh, Austrian and German scientists who discovered it, Kornhuber and Dieker. It was the name given to a gradual buildup of electrical activity that precedes voluntary movement. So around a second or sometimes even more, sometimes like two seconds, before a voluntary action like pressing a button, you begin to see more and more electrical activity building up, particularly over the frontal parts of the scalp. Just the movement areas. The movement, planning, decision-related areas. Um, and particularly in the midline, the so-called medial frontal areas. And the readiness potential simply refers to that gradual rising deflection. And the electrical activity builds up and up and up in a pretty linear ramp-like fashion. And just before the participant actually presses the button, there's a sudden reversal, a sudden drop in the electrical potential, and the red readiness potential comes to an end. So that's what the readiness potential is. Why is it at all relevant to free will? Well, the interesting um, idea, really, is that the readiness potential may represent preparation or initiation or getting ready to move. 
So it represents the development of the, the motor act of which will lead to pressing the button. And as I've said, it often begins one or even two seconds before the button press itself. So the reason why the Libet experiment is interesting is that the brain is preparing the motor action at the point that the readiness potential begins. Let's say that's one second before the button press. But the participant only reports the conscious feeling that they are about to press the button a couple of hundred milliseconds before the button goes down. So what that means is that there's a really rather long period of time, if you're thinking about brain time, during which the readiness potential is developing, the movement appears to be coming along, moving in preparation towards the actual execution. But the person is not yet conscious that they are about to press the button. So during that period, what you would perhaps want to say is that your brain knows that you're going to move, <laughs> but you don't. And that's really paradoxical because that's not how free will feels when we introspect. And that is the great uh, contribution or controversy because that means our brain is already going to move before we think we are in charge of doing it. So rather than me making my brain, the meek in quotes, right. me making my brain work, the brain is making me work. In fact, the brain is fooling me to making me think that I'm operating it when it's operating me. I mean, that's a simplistic view. That's Yes, <laughs> but you've got it. So indeed, because the brain activity comes first and the conscious thought, I'm about to press the button, comes second, there's no way that the conscious thought can really be part of controlling the action, right? So the brain is controlling the action, and you may have the conscious experience that you're about to act pretty much as, a, as an afterthought. It's not in control. All right, so let's look then at this readiness sure. potential, because it's very significant. First of all, some, a very simple question. Do you ever have a readiness potential without a movement, and do you ever have a movement without a readiness potential? Okay, so that's a really good question. So the way that the readiness potential is measured is by continuously recording the EEG, the electrical activity from electrodes placed on the scalp, mm -hmm. and then averaging the recordings time locked to the moment of the button press. Mm -hmm. So we might ask the participant to make 40 or 50 button presses whenever they feel like it. And we'll take a little segment of the electrical recording just around the time of the button press. And we'll average all of those recordings. And each recording itself is rather noisy because there are lots of other things going on in the brain at the same sure. time as the preparation sure. of the button press. So you're adding them all together. To you add them all together and then you can see a signal a out of signal the noise. comes up out of the noise, exactly. Mm -hmm. When you do that, you're, you're doing something rather odd because you're looking for the brain activity around the time of the button press and you can see this gradual ramp-like mm -hmm. build-up of activity, which we call the readiness potential. But you can only do that when you get a button press. So how do we know that there aren't readiness potentials happening all oh. the time? Oh. And unless the participant actually presses the button, we're just going to miss them oh. because we won't know when to look at the EEG mm -hmm. recording. Mm -hmm. And that's your question's very pertinent because it is exactly the... Uh, charge or the question that was raised in a, an influential paper in 2012 by Aaron Scherger and Stanislas Dehaan in Paris. So they hypothesized that maybe the readiness potential is just some kind of horrendous artifact of the kind that really keeps uh, scientists awake at night. And the, the, the reasoning goes like this. Suppose that brain activity just fluctuates all the time randomly because it's a biological system. It's, it's got noise in it. Mm. And suppose that, that this fluctuating level of activity in the brain is one of the things that influences whether we do anything or not, whether we press a button or not, whether we notice a stimulus or not, whether we're... Uh, all, all of our cognitive activity may depend on the general fluctuating state mm -hmm. of brain arousal. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're only going to measure brain activity time-locked to the moment when a person presses a button, and if the person's pressing the button only happens when the fluctuations of the brain activity mm -hmm. happen to reach a particular level of intensity to tip the person over from not bothering to do anything to pressing the button, then what we're going to see when we average those traces is exactly a gradual buildup of this 
actually random <laughs> fluctuation, which looks exactly like the readiness potential. So the charge basically is the readiness potential is simply capitalizing on random fluctuations that go on in the brain and which happen to influence whether we move or not. And it's not really the cause of the action at all. Mm. Now, that's a pretty severe charge because one of the few uh, pieces of evidence, that one of the few windows we have into voluntary action and human volition and into will is this neural signal, which we think is related to to volition and to will. And if it's actually just a, a random artifact, then there's a problem. What's your view? Okay, so my view is that the the basic assumption of the Sugar and Dehan model is correct. But I think there's one problem which they can't explain particularly well. Why does the amplitude of the readiness potential, the size of this electrical uh, buildup, before an action. Why does that change so much as a function of lots of factors that we really think are relevant to volition? So the more you think about your action, the more effort you put into it, the harder the action is to make. So if you make the button press sort of difficult, uh, then what you find is the readiness potential is larger and begins earlier than when the action mm. is simply mm. easy. So I think the existence of a readiness potential could be related to fluctuations in the brain, sure. But I think the fact that the, that the amplitude of the readiness potential varies as a function of parameters that we want to think are part of how we do things, how hard we try, I think that's rather harder for that uh, artifactual explanation to, to, to deal with. So as you would sum up uh, in terms of the importance of the readiness potential in appreciating free will. Yeah, I would think that the readiness potential really is a bona fide signal related to volition and related to intention. I can give you some further evidence of that. If you actually record from individual neurons in the relevant part of the brain, which can be done in animals and under some very particular clinical circumstances where neurosurgeons are operating on the brain, it can be done also in humans you see that the firing of individual neurons also begins to get stronger as you get closer and closer to the moment of pressing the button. So I think there's ample evidence that this really is a building signal related to the movement that we're about to make.